Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions virtual event, Suits and Skirts, Game On, The Battle for Corporate Power. My name is Greg Newman, Director of Communications for World Council. Today's event will feature a conversation between myself and Teresa Freeborn, who authored a book with the same title as this webinar. She says, women have been seeking power equity for decades to no avail because men are keeping women from attaining powerful C-suite and board positions to the detriment of corporate bottom lines. The reasons vary according to Teresa, but the results do not. Women are still highly underrepresented in leadership roles. Today, Teresa will address those points. We want to note World Council of Credit, Credit Unions is not endorsing Teresa's viewpoint, and we know this discussion may ruffle some feathers, but she claims her book establishes unequivocally that there is a problem of inequality, even if you don't think so. Teresa will demonstrate how men consciously or unconsciously hold women back, and more importantly, how to change that corporate culture. If any questions come into your mind as you listen to today's conversation, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type them in there. I will ask them of Teresa as time allows. Also, this virtual event is being recorded and will be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Teresa Freeborn into the conversation now. Teresa, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks for being willing to do this webinar with us today. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Great to be on. Good to have you. Well, first, just to give people some understanding of your background, you have a lot of experience in both the US and Canadian credit union markets. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I've spent my entire career, um, which is four decades plus, in credit unions, um, half that time in, in the Canadian credit union system and the latter half in the US. And I started like a lot of women have in my industry. I started as a credit union teller in small town, British Columbia in Canada. I did work my way up to a credit union president CEO in Southern California. I raised a family during that time. I got my MBA during that time. But I also focused a lot of my energy on sort of credit union system initiatives over the years and programs. So I was involved with um, our local league here in um, California. I was on the board of CUNA, various foundations, CUES, um, and I was a, a real champion of the Credit Union National Awareness Initiative. So I've certainly spent some time in the whole industry as well. I, I retired just a year ago. Um, as the president of Connecta Federal Credit Union, they're about a seven and a half billion dollar credit union located in Manhattan Beach, California. Um, but then I moved very quickly into writing this book, and um, I've now transitioned to more of a speaker and an executive consultant. I also, um, because I have a little more free time, I'm working closely with my daughter in a business that she and I founded back in 2016. And it's a woman owned, women run fashion brand, it's direct to consumer all online, our hero piece is a romper because women want something that's a little more comfortable. So that's what we designed. And um, Ashley, my daughter is the smash and Teresa is Tess and she's the CEO and I work for her and I love it. It's just super fun and check us out on smashtest.com because you're gonna see the kind of fun we can have as a women owned, women led business, it's very exciting. All right, well, you know of what you speak with the background that you have, especially in credit unions, but you said you got to writing this book almost as soon as you left the credit union world. Why and, and why now? Yeah, well, um, you know, along with my day job over all those years in the credit union movement, I personally have been involved with championing the advancement of women in leadership. So this has been for decades. In fact, I was one of those women alongside Diana Dykstra, the current chair of World Council, and Sue Mitchell and Patsy Van Auerkirk. And we huddled together with Brian Branch, the previous uh, CEO of World Council. And that was about 14 years ago, I think. And we got together to start Global Women's Leadership Network. So it started back then. But I was also involved in a whole bunch of other initiatives that would constantly push and forward uh, the advancement of women in leadership. Hey, I, I, I burned my bra in the 70s. You know, we go back that far here, okay? <laughs> um, I'm seriously tired of hearing the statistics about the lack of progress. And, and quite frankly, to take a phrase from the old movie network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. It's kind of how I came out of the gate here. I'm outraged, actually, by the, by the pace of progress that's much too slow. And, 
And if you call an increase in the Fortune 500 of 40 female CEOs over the course of 50 years, if that's a success, then I really do question your math skills. And think about it. One female CEO in 1971, fast forward to 2022, we have 44 female CEOs. 50 years it took us to get to that place. That's not an improvement. It's ridiculous. So I really got fired up about this. And and um, then if you look at women on boards, oh my goodness, I, I go down a whole other track on that one because I don't care how you look at it, you know, or how you want to spin it. But when women only make up 20% of corporate board positions, and that's globally, so that's every country involved here, you're never going to see a major change if that number doesn't change. There's a whole bunch of boards that have no women and a whole lot more that think having one or two is just fine. So, you know, I'm convinced that progress and change regarding gender parity, gender equity, um, it's a direct result of people demanding some change. And those are the activists, those are the advocates, the leaders, the innovators, these are the people here. And, and I truly wanted to just do my part here. It's time to sort of shout this from the rooftop. So, and I guess I had some time, right? I resigned, um, I retired in January of last year and um, put some pen to paper and away we went. The book was just released uh, last month. So it's been a busy yeah, the- year. <laughs> and the book doesn't pull any punches. Why did you decide to speak, as you put it, directly to the men in leadership roles and in the manner that you do? Because it's, it's, it, is, it is right in your face. And, and I, I know that you feel that was important to do it that way. It, it is. And I, I guess it goes back to what my thesis is. And, and my thesis is that it, it is the men who are keeping women from obtaining those powerful C-suite and board positions. And more importantly, though, is to the detriment of their corporate bottom lines. And I really go to great pains in the book to really spell that out. Um, as, as, as you mentioned in my intro, you know, the, the reasons vary for sure. Um, but let's just keep looking at the results. OK, that's the most important thing. Women are still terribly underrepresented in leadership roles. And there's so many books out there for women that are directed at women to help them advance in leadership. Plenty of conferences, lots of symposium, lots of networks for women. And we women encourage, for sure, we encourage each other. We share our learnings. We lament the current state of our representation at senior levels. This is is not new news, right? But this book speaks directly to the men that are blocking women's corporate advancement. I have not seen a lot of books that actually speak directly to the men. And it's kind of surprising if you think about it, because we all know that it's the men that are in the positions of power. They're in those leadership roles in these corporations. And if you think about it, quite naturally, they're going to be the only ones that can actually fix the problem, right? And to make these points and still be heard has sort of resulted in a no holds barred discussion that I've done here in this book. And it will ruffle some feathers. I've already had that kind of feedback and that's good. That's good. I I like the attention it's getting. So, but I'm calling men out here. I really am in the book to take a hard look at the hard facts, Um, demanding that they reevaluate and that they acknowledge their behavior. They become more of a woman's advocate instead of an adversary. And it's, it's, it just comes down to the fact that they have the control and they can make the change because they have the control. I know you said you you feel like this book should be on the nightstand of every male CEO and board member, but because of some of the frank statements that you make about men in leadership roles throughout the book, you've been criticized as being anti-male. Can you respond to some of that criticism? Yeah. So first of all, the, it's kind of fun to say that it should be on the nightstand of every male CEO and board member. But um, quite frankly, we all know this. Bedtime reading is supposed to be uh, stress reducing, right? You know, <laughs> this is not designed to do that. So it's going to agitate you. So uh, bedside maybe is not the perfect place for it. So, um, but yeah, let's talk about that anti-male. So yes, I've been accused of that. And funny, when I had my son who's 40 years old and I had him read a couple of the chapters at the very beginning, his first reaction is, mom, you're coming across as a bit of a man hater here. Like what's going on? And then he stuck with it and realized that that's not what this is. I am not anti-male. We need men on our side to make the change happen. But you know what? They need to know what to change and how to go about it. So the book will come across as being anti-male for sure. But really, let's just say in terms of leadership, I'm I'm just pro-female. That's, that's where I come from. And importantly, just remember what I'm talking about here is 50% as a goal in in terms of women at a leadership table. This isn't some Amazonian Greek mythology of 100%. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about 50%, right? Just imagine what the world could look like if women held 
that proportionate share of leadership, like 50-50. Think of what the agenda would be. Think about how the, the discussions would take place, what the discussions would be, the kind of strategies that we would make, and of course, what the results would be. So although my words may come across as anti-male, it's really just my disruptive approach to the problem. I had to kind of do a little bit of a wake-up call here. And just keep remembering, as you read the book, though, what women want, and quite frankly, what they deserve at this point in time is that they want a chance to move up the corporate ladder. They want a chance at the boardroom table. They want the same opportunities and the same positions of power that men already have, but they're kind of determined to keep for themselves. So what is keeping women from being, why are they being frozen out of the C-suites and boardrooms? And do you think it's intentional on the part of men? Do you think it's subconscious on the part of men? Is it a mix of both? Well, it is a mix of both, uh, Greg, for sure. You know, there's this general, um, but widespread lack of awareness and acceptance of the problem for starters. So that's the first thing you have to do to address any problem. Can we just all accept that there is a problem? And all you got to do is look at the stats for that. Now, there's plenty of reasons as to why they're being frozen out of the C-suite, but you know, the age old reasons like misogyny, like discrimination, like chauvinism, like how about a, just a workplace culture that has so many institutional biases and ingrained sexism that we don't pay attention to. It exists every day. This isn't something from the 50s here, okay? This is not, this is today. This is the work environment today. Corporations just have not adapted to the dual role that uh, women especially have, that is as workers and caregivers, because we still have to balance that. That is, that is a huge problem. And corporations just aren't considering or treating men and women equally in that regard. So face it, corporations were set up by men for men. Okay, they never envision women in these senior roles. It's, it's a tough thing to change over these years, but that's really what I'm trying to push on. And, you know, you write about everything and back it up with data. So okay. you mentioned earlier, I think it was one CEO in 1971, and now we're yeah. only up to 44. Is there other data you can point to to show how rare it is to have females in leadership roles. I mean, for the first time in our history, Royal Council has a board chair and a president CEO, both women. How rare is that, for instance? To, oh just goodness. to toot our own horn for a little bit, because we were behind the curve, I think, five years ago. I've been waiting for this day, and it's so exciting that we're there with Royal Council. I love it. So I, I will talk to that in a second, but let's just talk about the data. So <clears throat> if you think about it, if I wanted men to really read this book and make sure that those that are reading the book are understanding that what I discuss in the book is not based on my opinion. Okay. That's easy to do. We all know what Teresa's opinion is, but it's also based on fact. This is happening and the data proves that it is happening. So I go to great lengths in this book. We've got at the, at the end of the book are 12 pages of endnotes just to cite the research and the data sources that were that I, I comb through the internet, I comb through libraries just to get this kind of data to support what I'm what I'm saying. Each chapter has its own little, I have a section called Just the Facts, Sir, at the end of every chapter. There's 10 chapters, it's an easy read, guys, so you can get through this pretty quickly. But again, um, just trying to highlight the sources of data that prove the same thing over and over and over again. And then I went out another step further and I conducted my own primary research. I actually went and um, set up a, a firm back in on the, on the East Coast, and I had them do some online research on that front too, just again, to qualify, confirm the kind of opinions that I was stating. Now, in terms of World Council, <clears throat> I just am so excited about this, and I, I'm glad to see these very talented women at the helm. It's about time is what I would say. Um, and it's ridiculously rare out there. It is truly the exception, no question. Um, and I would like to commend the World Council's board. I'd like to commend the members of World Council who make this happen because it's time. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the stats earlier, but I really don't see any widespread, widespread change right now. So what I see is this anomaly. And it's, it's great that it's there and it's a good example because here's what I also believe that those organizations, and again, there's, there's reference to this in the book, but those organizations with a female chair, for instance, they beget a greater percentage of women on their boards. And it's by double, okay? So that's a significant statistic. So there's something to be said for the adage, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. 
right? So you see women in these positions of power, other women go, yeah, I can be that. See, I can, I can, I can aspire to that. So I'm delighted with World Council's progress here. It's an anomaly. Fantastic. Well, that's good to hear. We are as well. You mentioned in the book that there are still to this day persistent myths men have about women in the workplace. What are some of those that are still out there? Well, there's a heck of a lot to talk about. So I'll try and keep it concise here. You got to read the book and you'll get the rest of them. But um, I think that there are still a lot of men out there in corporate power that have some pretty messed up, <clears throat> pretty fossilized ideas about women in the workplace. And we need to address these and we need to address them like yesterday, right? So these arcane beliefs, they range from things like, oh, women can't control their emotions. Really? Um, I've worked for a lot of men out there and I'm going to tell you, um, they can't control their emotions either. I mean, so seriously, I, I can't believe that this is still a firmly had belief. It, out the it, it's it. kind of a difference of what you qualify as emotions, isn't it? Right. Yep. Yes. Well, first of all, I mean, I know women, um, myself included, I can get emotional. I get emotionally connected to things that will make me cry. Women cry. It's okay. But so do men. You know, I just watched the Garth Brooks special. He cried through the whole darn thing. You know what I mean? I know that, that's that vulnerable side. So yes, we are emotional, but it doesn't get in the way of leadership. That's, right. that's the key, right? Um, how about that women can't possibly prioritize um, work responsibilities over family? Yes, they can. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I, I'd like to talk more about that one too, because I still think that's a really big problem. And the fact that that myth still is there that we couldn't possibly you know, um, give the kind of attention to business when we have a family. How about that pregnant women can't be effective at work? That's another big myth out there. Really? I've had two children worked right up to, to drop date, you know, and um, funny, didn't get in the way, but, you know, there's still sort of a, a commonly held myth there that women are risk averse, too risk averse to be leaders. I, I again, question where that came from, but it's not true. Women are not as educated. Oh, my goodness. Women are coming out of every faculty. We all know this. We've all read those stats. And really, more they're more women. educated, aren't they? I mean, every they, stat they that are. I've seen. Yeah. Out of every faculty. So it's almost like, oh, come on. That's not an excuse anymore. We've got, we got the education and we got the chops. So put us in coach. You know, that's kind of how I feel. Uh, how about speaking softly as a sign of weakness or incompetence even? We don't have to own the room when we walk in. Okay? Women just are wired differently. We want to hear what others have to say, and then we'll give our two cents. We won't repeat something somebody else already said. We just have a different way of it, but it sort of comes across as this sign of weakness or incompetence. You know, all of these things are still harbored and they're still ingrained. So they are real. And I'm glad you raised them because I think all of us that are listening today will, will go, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, check. You know, I mean, that's what that's how we're feeling. It's very true. Now you also talk about the fact that men sabotage women in the workplace. And again, I don't know if you mean that's conscious or unconscious, but what are some of the ways you're talking about how men do that? Yeah. And, and sabotage always sounds like such a bad word, but I think that put it in this context, you know, it's interesting that this is the something that, that I really did discover as I was doing the research here that corporations and by and large men who lead them, they seem to be oblivious, like absolutely oblivious or indifferent or worse, overtly obstructive to any matters related to the advancement of women. So for instance, um, I'd walk into a room of all male leaders and it, it's it's normal for them. Well, Teresa, I don't know what you're talking about. There is no woman problem. Look at you. You know, you've, you've climbed the corporate ladder. What's the big deal? Uh, or they'll refer to a recent news story. One woman that, that did something terrific and made it to a certain spot. And it's like, oh yeah, well, that proves it right there. There's not a problem. You know, um, or the best one is always, well, I tried to hire a woman once, but, you know, I didn't get any good candidates. These are all sort of get out of jail free cards. You know, it's 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 you, you can't believe that stuff. So that's the first thing. But I would say that the major roadblock is is men's lack of advocacy for them. So it has to be top of mind. And if men truly show up every day at the office and think about that and think about how can I get to a 50-50 level here, they're going to find that it permeates everything. So now several things come to mind when I think of sabotage. Okay, so clinging to that old work slash family narrative. Yes, I've already mentioned that earlier. And it's a corporation's feeling about maternity leave. It's the motherhood penalty is real. 
So women um, are just, as soon as someone announces they're going to have a baby right away, the whole organization is thinking, oh, this is going to cause us nothing but grief. And it's like, no one's celebrating this. It's going to be disruptive. And we're going to have to hold that job for her when she gets back. I mean, there's a penalty there and you get kind of sidelined. You get forgot about because you're going to take some leave. All of that stuff happens. So those things are real. Um, but I guess I'm here to say, guess what? Women can have children and still be great at our jobs. I know, shocker, right? But we we can. So the other thing that comes to mind when I think of sabotage, I think, and again, not maybe intentionally, is the networks, men's networks, okay? The old boys club is still very real and it's very prominent. There's the boys' nights out, it's the golf outings, it's the drinks after work. What do you think women are doing after work? First of all, they're never given any notice to join the guys after work. And if they are, they have to sit and think, geez, how am I going to do everything when I get home? I got to get dinner on for the kids. I got to get homework done, bath time, prep for tomorrow. I mean, there's a lot that goes on in the evening. So let alone checking your emails and seeing what else you had left you know, to do for the day. So men have an ability to still have those networks. Everything happens in those clubs, in those networks. That's when you find out when those new positions are coming open. That's when you can get under someone's radar, on someone's radar about a job promotion, things that you aspire to. Those, those things do work really well, but they never envision women in them. And it's hard to break those things. And, and like I said, I don't know if it's intentional or it's just, it just becomes this rote way to approach the world. So it's very difficult. But then of course, there's all these um, I would say. Is, it, can I ask, is that generational? Yeah. And I ask that because oh. you know, I'm a, I'm a Gen X guy and I have always had as many female friends at work as I have male friends and same with going out after work and so forth. So is this, am, am I rare? Is, or is this something that is an issue with baby boomers and you're seeing less and less of it as you go down through the generations or do you see it the same way everywhere? You know, that's a really good question because if you think about it, um, generational, it sounds like sort of a, to me, it sounds like a bit of a convenient justification, okay? Um, the baby boomer generation isn't going anywhere. We all know that they're going to, influence- well, at some point they are, <laughs> Yeah, but they're going to, in- not, not in the short term, not for in the next no. couple of decades, they're no. not going anywhere. They're going to influence this world for many more years to come. You know, if you can have an 80 year old president, you know, you just so you Very know, true. that's still coming, Very right? True. So I, that's what I believe, but millennials and Gen Z's that's interesting because they are very different in their leadership styles. I agree with that. There are a lot more young fathers who actually want to spend more time with their families. Um, the reality is, I mean, we all know this reality is that most families need two income earning parents simply to meet the cost of living. So that's not going anywhere, right? But it's still the woman who is expected to take on more than her fair share of the so called domestic responsibilities. Okay. These young fathers aren't they're not yet entirely convinced that they have to do 50% of the child rearing, 50% of the running of the household, the cooking, the cleaning, the bath time, the homework. And once that happens, well, that's, that's a big game changer right there. So I, I think some evidence of this is that, you know, there are some corporations that are providing family time off for both parents to bond with babies as they're born, but it's very rare for men to take advantage of those programs today still. So what's in the way of that? You know, I think COVID helped us because men got to be, fathers got to be home, just like the moms got to be home with kids everywhere. And I think there was a much better appreciation for what has to be done to run households and to rear children and to get the food on the table and all of that. So all of these things contributed, but there's still this stuck, even as I interview men, um, young men about this situation, whether there's a woman problem. You know, I, I, I spoke at a conference last summer and I was astounded at the end of it. A, a guy came up to me and he says, you know, Teresa, I have always consider myself to be this very supportive. I've got two daughters, they're teenagers. I want the best for them. I want everything for them that I, I want for sons if I had them. But he said, as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing that I kind of resemble some of those remarks. So I got, I got out my game. I got to do something different here. So it, that was very reassuring to me. You know, you mentioned that, and I have a friend who's a CEO in another industry. She's been a CEO for a long time, over a decade. And so she sits on a lot of boards and, mm-hmm. and other things. And she's, she said to me that she, re, she realizes anytime she goes into a meeting outside of her organization, she's expected to be the one to take notes. 
by the by the men oh. in the room. Uh, are there are there ex and, and I admit that I'm probably the last guy who's going to volunteer to take notes, and I don't know if I have that same expectation. But are there those like things that we don't think about? I never would have thought of that until she said it to me, and then I thought, you know, you're right. At our organization, even it's the women who are generally taking the minutes or taking the notes. Yeah, and I guess I'd, I'd comment in two ways about that. First of all, um, I, as a woman, um, I've always wanted to find a role for myself, at, whether it's any committee meeting or any organizational discussion or whatever. I wanted to find a role for myself. I want to put my hand up so that I could have the experience and I could get the acknowledgement and that would help me. That was my way of sort of making sure that I was sort of top of mind for consideration. So I would volunteer for these things. I think a lot of women do that. They they certainly volunteer, which is terrific. However, um, guys are too quick to sort of look to them as, oh, you can be the stenographer. You know, you can be the one. I, I In my experience, and again, I mean, I came through the, the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and it's it wasn't uncommon for guys to look at me and say, well, could you get me a coffee? You know, like, really? I have to get you a coffee. So those things still exist. I think less so than they used to, but there's still a... It's, it's easy to, to let the woman who usually jumps in, okay, because they want to prove their worth. And that's going to happen. So men will take advantage of that. But in a way, as long as you're letting a woman do it because she's excited about doing it, she wants to do it, that's fine. But when you sort of suggest that it's women's work, that's where I get a little, you know, uncomfortable. Yeah. That's not that's not a good place to be. Not a good place. No. I, I want to ask about this because this is really getting to something that I think if we're talking about men listening to this and, and being open to this conversation, you make clear in the book that more women in leadership roles means oh. higher profits for companies. Can you give us some data points on that? Yeah. And again, the book is full of these data points for this. But let, let's just say this. The first thing I want everyone to acknowledge is that it is a fact involving women in decision making for your business is good for your business right report after report countless academic papers what i've noticed and in the research that i've done is that all of it seems to be falling on deaf ears i'm not so sure men are willing to embrace this and to accept it and yet it is it is out there so the first thing i would say is can we just all agree that it's a fact okay um leaving women out of senior positions puts your company at a significant disadvantage in terms of growth and bottom lines. And I mean, I'm talking about better credit quality. If, if you've got gender parity, you've got better credit quality, you've had less governance related controversy, you have better corporate cultures, and you have a better bottom line. It's official. Okay, it's official. Having gender parity does improve and boost your business. And the, the stat that I used there is that gender diverse companies outperform others by 15%. I mean, it's, it's a higher return on sales. It's a higher return on invested capital. It's a higher return on equity. And this isn't just Teresa talking about this. this is study after study after study. So they're out there and the book cites all of that. So you can feel free to, to have a look at it if you don't believe it yet, but it's, it's really true. There's no question. And, and you also claim that a majority of men in leadership roles fear women in these same roles. That That is really interesting to me. Do you, have you talked to people or do you have a feeling as to why that is? Well, I think that, first of all, the the fear of losing power is real. It's absolutely real. But I would also add that men aren't necessarily sure of how to interact with women in senior leadership roles. If they were sure, I think they'd do a better job of it. So, and I list lots of examples of that. I, I just think they don't know how to do it, right? So face it, men are used to the boys club. So think of small talk. I, I walk into a business meeting, um, it's mostly men. I'm the first woman to walk in the door. The small talk is all sports. The small talk is all, I don't know, the latest ride a mower. I don't care what it is. It's all male oriented stuff, right? And I walk in the room and you think that that would be an opportunity to shift the conversation. It never is. It never is. So it's just not, it's not being aware that it should be more inclusive that way, right? So I think it's because they don't know what to do. They're nervous about it. So they don't know what to do and how to, how to shift a, a, you know, a discussion. So I, I think, again, back to the corporate America 
was really, and credit unions, they're no different here. I know I've been asked that question, is, are, is the credit union industry different from corporate America? It's not really. Um, men, I mean, corporate America was made by men for men, you know, um, women were those subservient note takers. That's what they did at the beginning. They never envisioned a place for women at that senior table. Change is just so darn difficult to make. I mean, if it was so easy, we'd be there by now, but it's, it's very difficult. You talk about the fact too, that, you know, men are the problem as you see it. They're also the solution. So how are they solution? And, 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 and why can they be that solution? I think this is probably um, the shortest response I have for you because since men have the power, right? They, they have the control. They actually have the solutions. And it's about being sort of pushed to actually come up with those solutions quickly, quickly for the, for the benefit of your organization. I don't care what kind of an organization it is. Uh, I don't care if it's government. I don't care if it's, it's a credit union, corporation, healthcare education, pretty much every faculty out there. Um, men have the power, they have to be involved in the solutions. And I, I, I truly believe that how you get there is to enlist the women that work with you, get them to tell you what's wrong and what needs to be changed. So men have the control of it, they have the power to do it, but they gotta be open to it. They gotta be seeking that resolution for sure. You write that many women have to leave organizations to move up. So what do you, what is your advice for women who feel undervalued right now? And they're butting up against a brick wall in their career at the organization that they're currently at. Mm. It's been the same advice I've given for years, probably. And, and, and that is, is if your company or your credit union isn't valuing you or you don't see a chance of upward mobility, a, a track to get you to the place you want to be? Or how about just a chance to earn what your male counterparts are earning? But if you don't see that, then I'd say get out and I'd say move on. And my- Is that, That's here, a tough thing to hear because, you know, I, I was once in a, in, in a different industry where that was common, that that was known that if it, men or women, if you wanted to move up, you kind of had to go somewhere else. And that that's a tough thing to hear, right? And accept sometimes. Oh, it's a very difficult thing. It's very disruptive, right? So if I think of myself, um, I wasn't being frozen out. I, I spent the first couple of decades in the Canadian credit union system, and I ended with a very senior post at Central One. And um, I loved my job, but I knew that my boss wasn't going anywhere. I knew I wasn't being groomed for that position. Um, there was a lot of consolidation going on in the industry at the time. And I knew that the chances of those CEO jobs were becoming slimmer and slimmer. And when I was offered a position south of the border, I thought, okay, I'm going huge risk, huge. I didn't know anybody at all in the industry. I, I'd never been to California since I went to Disneyland when I was 15. I mean, it, the whole experience was a really, it was a big, tough decision, but man, I have no regrets over it. So yes, it's going to be risky. It's going to feel awkward. You don't have to change countries like I did, I don't think. I mean, but, right. but you got to be gutsy enough to do it. And, and I think those companies and those credit unions that aren't figuring out how to integrate women into the top of their organization, if you do that, you're not going to have those women leave, which is just a huge asset to you. That it, but if you don't do that, the women will leave. They're going to start their own companies. A whole bunch did during COVID. That, that was just sort of the the opener right there. And um, so don't kid yourself. It's happening every day. It's a really serious issue for corporations to hang on to these up and coming women that have huge um, opportunity to add value to your organization, but you're going to let them, they're going to let them leave, you know? It's, so it's what are some of the things, what are, what are some of the first few things a company could do to affect real change for women to make sure that they have opportunities? They're not having to leave to get those opportunities. Right. <laughs> um, Again, I, I sound like a broken record here, but you've got to, from the very top, embrace diversity and gender balance from the CEO's office, from the boardroom. And can we just start counting? When you tell me that you don't think you have a woman problem, can you just go back to your organization? I challenge everybody on this call. Tell me that you're at 50-50. And by the way, some of you are. I know Connecta, for instance, their board is 60% uh, female versus male. So, I mean, uh, there are some that have done it and made it, and I'm really excited about that. 
Let's start counting. Remember the goal. We're looking for 50-50 here. Then I would suggest that you present the findings and you ask the women about those goals, um, which ones to set, but how about what are the strategies to get there, right? So they have something to say. They're not being asked. And women tend to wait to be tapped on the shoulder to be asked. So ask them. They've got some answers for you. So that would be the next thing. And then I would say, once you do that and you put some strategies in play, that I would suggest that you be so transparent about the findings. The findings aren't going to be pretty, but you, you've got to put them out there and you've got to say, here's where we're at. Here's where we're going. Let's work on this together. And I even include in the book a, a women's corporate bill of rights because I just think that sometimes institutions just need some foundation to work with. And that's what that provides for them. Here are all the steps you can take to make sure you've got some living, breathing thing here that's going to move us to that goal of 50-50. Um, for those who joined us late, we are going to have a question and answer period where you can uh, submit your questions for Teresa and I will ask them of her. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you want to type your question there, we'll ask those uh, coming up here in, in just a few minutes. I want to ask you, what thought would you like to leave men with who think right now there is no problem, maybe they're even watching this and they're thinking, ah, we don't have that issue at my workplace and things are just fine. What what thought would you leave them with? I'd probably want to leave them with a disruptive kind of challenge for them, right? There is a serious problem and believing that there isn't is just nonsense. Talk to the women, ask the women, they're going to tell you there's a problem. So there's the first thing. And then I'm going to reiterate the idea that it's a mindset. Women are your equal. You have to know it, you have to believe it, and you have to behave like they already are their, your equal, which they are. You have to think about it. You have to con continue to think about it every minute of the day that you're in the office. You've got to make space for talented women. You've got to, and this isn't going to be popular, but my view is always that you've got to perhaps even step down. You have to step back and you have to step sideways. I, I'm. It sounds like affirmative action but you don't have to have affirmative action. You can see the good sense in this. And you may have to take a step down to let women in face it. We're talking 50-50. They're not gonna take over the world here. Okay, they they just want the rightful place where they should be in decision-making. So that's what I would leave for the men. And what about the women? What, what thought would you like to leave the women with who are most of our attendees today are women? What thought would you like to leave them with? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I wrote the book for men and then I had a bunch of women always come to me and say, Teresa, you know, you don't understand. This has been really helpful for me because it feels like a playbook. You know, I know now how to respond when I see and hear these things that are taking place out there right underneath my nose. I mean, and I don't know how to respond. I kind of laugh things off and like this stuff's still alive. These are young women telling me and giving me this feedback. So I think at the end of the day, it gives them a, that voice and a chance to speak up and feel okay about that and be part of that change. I, I mentioned as we kicked it off today that, you know, it's about being an activist. It's about being an advocate, but it's also about being a leader and it's about being an innovator. And this is what I hope it gives women that sort of voice and that chance to really take this and run with this and, and just, get as mad as I am. You know what I mean? Because, you know, emotion is what moves mountains here. So if you can get emotional about it and be angry about something, I suggest the change is going to happen a lot sooner. One question we already have is where can we find the book? We will have some information for you on that before we leave today's webinar. So just stay tuned for that. Um, but you can go to TeresaFreeborn.com if you want to find more information, but we'll have a little bit more information later. I want to get to some of the questions we have from the audience um, it, because you've talked about 50-50 and Barry from the UK points out, it's actually the population of the world is 52-48 women to men. Uh, but he says, until men in the business learn the basic math, they know nothing about this because they're disenfranchising economically the majority majority of potential leaders and consumers. Um, how do you teach men that basic math? Do you? Th and I think what he's getting at there is that they don't look at, maybe they don't look at the landscape and see it that way that it actually is. Do you think that's accurate? Oh, yeah. And all of that should have just been in the book, because that's exactly my premise here is that, um, you know, men, men, they at the end of the day, they just have to own that there is a problem here. 
at the end of the day. There's nothing else that has to happen first. Without that ownership, we can't begin to develop strategies. We can't begin to get people motivated to move this agenda forward and in the right direction. So yeah, it's, yeah. Do you, do you find, uh, another question here, do you find that men's clubs, as you put it, mm -hmm. uh, whether organized or, 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 you know, social, like going out, like you said, together, are they industry specific or do you see that in any industry that, that we have? Oh, I see them throughout everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Um, and it's just, um, women have their own networks. Okay. And this is the other thing I'm saying, well, we'll just start our own networks. The problem is, is that women's networks by and large, they don't have the power. Do you think that any powerful men would ever join a women's network? They do it because they want to be a shero or they want to, you know, support women in what they're doing, but they're not going there for the network. They're not going there for, oh, the, the relationship building that's going to help them advance. So women's networks are in a sense, a bit broken that way. We can continue to meet and it's good for us to get together and it's good for us to, um, by and large, commiserate and talk about the lack of progress. And yes, I have a, a really powerful networks all over the place that are very helpful. But at the end of the day, if I don't have men in those networks, I don't have access to that very senior, you know, senior, senior networking that needs to be done that the men have. They always will have that advantage. So we got to kind of figure that out again. Again, men have the control of that. What can they do about it? You know, I, I, I go ahead. No, no, please. I was just going to say, I do want to challenge you a little bit on that point, okay. because I look at something like Global Women's Leadership Network, which I know you, mm -hmm. you know, help set up and we're the chair of. And, and, I, and I do see that um, while I know what you're saying, there is a lot of uh, what we're talking about here. There's a lot of ways that women can learn from women who have done it right and who have made their way through the world and gotten to leadership positions. And we see examples of that all the time. So can you clarify a bit what you're saying when you say that women's networks are broken? Well, here's it. They're broken from a perspective of gaining senior positions because you're going to have to gain them from the men that hold them. Okay. So that's my only point about that is that there's something missing in that we, yes, we are very helpful with each other. No question. I, like I say, I respect my group. And if I have a question on how to handle a problem or handle a situation, I go to my network and they help me because they've all experienced it before. Trust me that those things aren't new. They're never new. But the problem is, is that this isn't the place you go to get that next position. Unless of course the women in there are in, their, are in those positions of power. And sometimes they are. So I know, for instance, one network I have, we're always looking for women that will replace retiring women in leadership roles, right? How do we do that? Um, and there's a lot of, if you look at our industry, the majority of credit unions are run by women. The, the issue is, is that the larger the credit union gets, the uh, fewer women, right? So I want to, if there's a perfect world here, I would love to see how we can take all of those very capable women that are running small credit unions that are so vital to those communities and help them with a network that gets them to be seated at the tables of those larger credit unions. Wouldn't it seem natural for that to happen? You go from smaller to larger. and But I don't think there's a sort of determined plan to make that happen, but that would be fantastic. So just remember, networks, I don't want you to think that it's it's just a place to gather and have a glass of wine and chat. No, I'm talking about networks that will actually move you forward in your career. Where's the power? You need to have people in that network that have the power to help you do that. Building on that answer a little bit, Ronnie asks, how do we bring more men into this conversation? And, you know, I, I wonder that, too, because I know I know men in, in this industry and in any industry that if you brought the topic of your book up to them, they would roll their eyes and, oh, and yeah. it would immediately shut down. Um, so but without that, it's not obvious how we can create change, Ronnie asks. So how do you how do you bring more men into the conversation? Oh, that's, that's the biggest challenge we have. <clears throat> and you're absolutely right. The eye rolling, like everyone just thinks I'm some, you know, man hating, you know, um, um, <laughs> evangelist out there. And I think it's very unfortunate. So it has to stop. It has to start at the board table. Now, here's the good news. We do have women at board levels and they need to be very loud voices at that board table. 
to make sure that this isn't just a one and done program. This isn't just, oh, we put in a DEI program, we're all good. You know, no, it doesn't work that way. Are you talking about it every day? Are you examining the results of those strategies every month in a board setting? It's really critical there. So it's going to take some gutsy moves by the men that are supportive of this, because there are men that are, I'm not suggesting all men aren't supportive of this. Of course they are, but they're kind of lonely there. They're, they don't have a lot of others that are rallying around with them, but it'll take those women and those men to just keep pushing the agenda. And as I said earlier, you know, if it was so darn easy, it'd be done. It's not easy. And there's a reason why we sit at this pathetic level of participation at that senior level. We've still got 15 minutes left in our in our time window here. Um, so a few more questions. Teresa, who is uh, actually one of our GWLN um, role models in a lot of ways, she spoke at our Cooperative Voices event for, for the foundation. She spoke at the GWLN luncheon, if any of you were at that in Washington, DC. Um, uh, in February, but she said, I read Suits and Skirts Game On. I just I just like every bit of it. How can you deal with the situation where some men always want to frustrate you when they feel you are a threat to them? And sometimes they even use your fellow women to turn against you. Oh, wow. Interesting question. It, it is. Um, you know, whenever I hear, it makes me right away think of um, the question I usually get is is more along the lines of, well, women have thwarted my you know, ability to get ahead. It's the women that are keeping me, holding me back. Once they've got it, they're not letting me in. I would just say that there probably are some misguided women out there that are like that. But I guess my my view is I have seen nothing but the majority of women helping other women move forward. I, I feel that. So if you're not getting that vibe from the networking groups you're in, you need to find it because it's there. Um, I, I loved Madeline Albright saying years ago where she said there's a special special place in hell for women who don't help women. And um, that's kind of how I've gone through life here is that you help women, you help them get ahead and you celebrate those men that are helping them get ahead as well, for sure. They exist out there. You just got to find them and, and ask them, how do they break through? So how do they break through those, the men's thinking out there? Uh, how do they help us do that? It's not something we can do on our own. Remember who's got the power here, right? Who, who can control the outcome are those with the power today. Do you think that it's a problem? I mean, Teresa's writing this question from Malawi in Africa. Do you, do you see what she's getting at? And do you, have you seen this in the West as well in, in countries like the US, Canada, since that's your experience? Oh yeah. And, and I guess where I see it, um, it's interesting. I, I, there's an example that I use in the book where um, I was asked by um, some leaders in the credit union industry in another country that said, look, we want you to help us. We want to move women into these leadership roles in our country. And, um, you know, we think they need some training. So I wonder, we'll put together the symposium. You all come together. We'll get some women on this panel. We'll all talk to the women. And my response was, that's not going to work. We already have that. What's going to work is, can you bring together a conference for men to talk about this issue and put your people up there in terms of a panel of men who have actually made it their business to advance women in leadership? Give some examples of how you can do that. Because if they're not going to listen, men aren't going to come to a, a, a conference that's headed up by women speaking on a panel. They're, they're going to come if they see something that looks like them at that panel. So maybe that's what we do. Maybe that's where it would have a far greater impact is if other men in senior positions of power were to talk about how they see this moving forward and getting to that 50-50 level. So I would challenge that we're too quick to go to the, let's let, let women explain how it's all gonna work. You know, no, we need the guys to, to help us there. And perhaps that's one of the, the better ways to do it. Um. We have a question about the book. We'll answer that here in a second. Um, we don't have any other questions that are open right now. Is there anything that, that you want to leave us with, uh, Teresa, before I before I close things out? Yeah. Um, you know, you touched on all my hot buttons today. So thank you for your, your great question. Yeah, it was a great conversation. I think a yeah. lot of people, even those who are probably right. saying, uh, I don't know about this, that they probably got a lot more yeah. out of it than they than they would have thought. Yeah, well, I thank you for that. And thank you for giving the opportunity to profile it like this. Um, I would just say that, um, you know, 
to the to the audience out there that if you it, it, I'm sure you'll all join me in knowing that the world will be a better place when we've got a 50-50 representation at senior decision level positions. Um, I, I just think the tone will be different. The agenda will be different. The strategies will be different. And of course, we all know once you've got all that in play, the results will be different. It'll be a better world for your sons and your daughters. And I know parents want everything that they can get for their daughters as much as they want them for their sons. There's no difference. But we have to start a lot of these things when they're kids, when they're when you know when you're when you're rearing your children. I mean, something as simple as um, you know, when I take my two-year-old granddaughter out for a walk in, in the yard and we see a ladybug or we see a squirrel. And I always make a point of saying, oh, look at her. Isn't she cute? It's very quick to, you just can't help yourself. You say, oh, look at him. Isn't he cute? But, you know, the, the, the female version exists too. So it's like being consciously aware of everything you do and say to those young, impressionable, you know, kids that we have out there, whether they're your grandchildren or your kids, there's lots that can be done there too to start to change that mindset at a very early age. But, oh, my goodness, there's a lot of work to be done. But it starts here. So I'm glad everyone's interested. And um, and let's see what we can do. Read the book. You're going to get a lot more detail there. And uh, it will give you a voice. It will give you a playbook that's going to help you as you try and make change in your organization. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I just want to uh, relate to people that if this virtual event has piqued your interest, and obviously from the comments, it has for a lot of people, and you want to purchase Teresa's book, you can find it at any number of online retailers, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So Amazon.com and also BarnesandNoble.com. Again, the full title is Suits and Skirts, Game On, The Battle for Corporate Power. And if you want to learn more about the book, and uh, want to message Teresa, you can also visit TeresaFreeborn.com. That's TeresaFreeborn.com. And if you want to follow up and say, I didn't catch all that, just email communications at woku.org, communications at woku.org if you have any questions. And if you like this event and you want others to see it, and I have a feeling some of you will, uh, you can refer them to the World Council YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash woku. It's going to be available there later today. Want to be part of more interesting sessions like this one, but in person next time? Well, be sure to register for our 2023 World Credit Union Conference, which we will co-host with the Canadian Credit Union Association from July 23rd to the 26th in Vancouver, Canada. We'd love to see you there, and you can register by going to wcuc.org. And just one more plug, if I can, since we do have a lot of women on for this conversation. If you want to hear a great summation of how World Council of Credit Unions is working for women across the global credit union movement, be sure to listen to this month's episode of our Global Credit Union podcast. Yes, it is hosted by me, but you can find that episode at woku.org. Just go to the newsroom tab and select Global Credit Union podcast. You can find all of the episodes there, actually. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great day.